This is the lecture for European history for Wednesday, the 23rd of um, February, uh, 2022. This is, of course, period three. And as we go through the mandatory giggles of some of our students, um, please take out that picture of the British Empire in your notes that we were looking at yesterday. <laughs> the sun never sets on the British Empire is literally true. Going westward from the British Isles, you have the Canadian Federation, which up until now has been free, uh, the uh, colonies of British Honduras, which is um, now uh, Belize, you have the British island of Jamaica, and other British islands in the West Indies, including Barbados, You've got British Guiana on the mainland of South America. You've got uh, the British Ascension Islands and uh, oh, what's the other South Atlantic island. I should probably look at this. I'm doing it all by waiting. Look at the Central South Atlantic. Here. Uh, oh, St. Helena, uh, Tristan da Cunha. We also have the Falklands Islands, South Georgia. South Shetlands and South Orkneys, all near Argentina, but not Argentinian. Ah! Stick it! Ah, sorry, I still remember the RGs trying to take the Falklands by force back in 82, the jerks. Uh, yes? Do you think we have any time to slightly discuss? Well, maybe, but if you're wasting time right now asking when we don't have time, if we have time, it'll be at the end of class. The Russian end history. of class. End of class. Uh... Let's see. We then shift over to Asia, where uh, in the Pacific, the British control Fiji, uh, taking control of the once uh, uh, horrific Cannibal Isles, um, New Zealand, the Maori Wars, Australia, um, Singapore, and Malaya. Malaya is actually not on that map, but it should be. Uh, North Borneo is Hong Kong, uh, areas of Shanghai, China, and Waihai Wei, which is near Tianjin, uh, near the coast, near Beijing, or Peking in those days. Um, and the British, of course, control most of the Indian Ocean Islands, like Diego Garcia. They control the Maldives, they control the Lacadives, they control the Seychelles, they control Mauritius. And, uh, of course, uh, Ceylon, which we call Sri Lanka today, and British India, which includes uh, India, Pakistan, Bhutan, Nepal, um, Sikkim, Bangladesh, and, of course, the British-controlled Burma. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, the British control Aden, near the southern end of the... Um, of the Red Sea, they control British East Africa, which we now call Kenya. Uh, they control uh, South Africa, Bechuanaland, Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, Nyasa Land, that today we call Malawi. Uh, the Rhodesias we call Zimbabwe and Zambia, respectively. Um, as well as uh, the Gold Coast, which we call Ghana. Um, Sierra Leone and the Gambia River. In the Mediterranean, they control Cyprus and Malta and Gibraltar. Literally, there was not a moment on Earth a hundred years ago and more that the British did not have the Union Jack flying over territory. The British controlled a fifth of the world's land area and a quarter of the no, oh, it's a quarter of the world's land area and a fifth of the population. Let's see. Yep. No, no, no. I always get these two things confused. Uh, the Brits control a quarter of the world's population, 23%, just under, and they control a full fifth of the world's land area, 20%. Biggest empire in human history, bar none. Makes the Mongols look 
stinky. Makes the Arabs small. Chinese Empire at its height. Don't even worry about it. Alexander's Empire, the Persian Empire, the Roman Empire. The British Empire is supreme among global empires because it is an industrial empire. Because it is a maritime empire. <clears throat> because unlike the land empires of pre-industrial times, <clears throat> the British conquer and rule through different means. It's not one army conquering everything in its uh, purview. It's a series of colonial takeovers, sometimes prompted by an anti-slavery campaign. If you look at the territories of Egypt and the Sudan, all the way down to Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, all that area in Central Eastern Africa, you will see that this creates a barrier between much of East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Why? Because the British didn't want the Arabs buying black slaves. They found a way around it, of course, but the British made it difficult for them. Why? Because the British were genuinely anti-slavery crusaders, and they fought wars to stop it. The choke point of the entire British Empire is Egypt, particularly the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal, built by the Frenchman de Lesseps, connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea at uh, the Mediterranean port of Suez. It is, unlike the Panama Canal, a big ditch. Sea levels are roughly equal between uh, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And so ships, as long as the canal is deep enough and wide enough, transit. It is the choke point of world trade, as we found out last year when some Nimrod crashed his ship into one of the shores, creating a bottleneck that lasted a few weeks. Global supply chains were disrupted. It's not, of course, why we have trouble with supply chains right now. That's a different story. But it showed how vulnerable the world is today at its choke points. Because even now, most of the world's uh, good, deep goods are transited uh, at some point or other by ship. The British Empire takes territory in part for an anti-slavery crusade. In part, they take territory for strategic location. By controlling Egypt, which means the Suez Canal, by controlling Aden, by controlling Gibraltar, just these three places, let alone all the other areas, allow Britain to have its maritime trade flow from the British Isles, here's Gibraltar, into the Mediterranean Sea, past Malta, past Cyrus, into British Egypt, and going across the Suez Canal, down the Red Sea, and then past Aden into the Indian Ocean. This is the global choke point of trade more than any other because Africa's big. And without the Suez Canal, shipping all has to go around Africa, which takes months longer, even with modern ships. Ships have to go around the Cape of Good Hope, which is the second or third most dangerous seaway in the entire world. All of this would make global trade and every product we, uh, that is shipped by it a bit more expensive. So the British take control of Suez, even though a Frenchman built the canal, even though a Khedive, a semi-independent Ottoman ruler, nominally rules Egypt, the British take it over because it is the key to controlling east of Suez, which means India, particularly, and Hong Kong, and uh, Singapore, and all the rest. So, <clears throat> strategic location. Why do the British, for example, control the Falkland Islands, which the RGs wrongly call Ilas Malvinas? Well, because it makes a, it is a good place to have a base because anyone wanting to go around the Cape, uh, Cape Horn is going to go past the Falklands. And uh, in the age of coal, 
having a coaling station on the Falklands and a Navy base there gives the British the ability to cut off trade or dominate trade around Cape Horn. And in World War I, this is going to prove useful. So much of the British territory is set up to control strategic locations. So anti-slavery crusade, you probably want to write these down. Anti-slavery crusade, yep. Um, let's see, what else? You got strategic location. Uh, Anti-slavery crusade. Strategic location. Natural resources. The British take rubber trees from South America. And they plant them in Malaya, where they take off like popcorn, popping in a skillet. Yet they used to use skillets to heat popcorn before they had preset bags of microwavable popcorn. Microwavable popcorn is better, I have to admit. But movie popcorn is better, still. So, why do they transplant rubber trees? I mean, the British control Guyana, there are rubber trees that can grow there. Because what the British are doing is they have Jamaica for sugar. They used to have the 13 colonies of British North America for timber and for uh, cotton and for tobacco. And Canada serves the timber needs uh, and the fur needs, um, pelts and things. Most British territory is taken not just for strategic location and anti-slavery crusade, but also because it can produce unique things for the British economy. Now, Britain will trade. In fact, at its height, Britain is a liberal, free trade-oriented empire. It gets beef from Argentina, it gets cotton from the American South, and both of these things are very important to Britain and Britain's lifestyle, Britain's standard of living. But this empire is not simply built because there's a lot of territory near Britain that they just conquered. That's the way the other empires, the pre-industrial land-oriented empires, work. Britain is different, and the other empires of the world are also different. Now, Britain... Being a constitutional monarchy has two political parties that dominate in the 1800s, the Liberal Party and the Conservative Party. The Liberal Party are sort of equivalent to some aspects of old-style American Democrats. The Conservative Party, in some ways, are, resemble American Republicans. They're not exactly the same. For example, British conservatives typically are far to the left of American Republicans today, certainly. But there's this conflict. And there are two prime ministers in the 1800s that tower above, above all others during this uh, question of imperialism. On the one hand, you've got William Gladstone. William Gladstone is the head of the Liberal Party. Shocking white hair, big sideburns. Mm. Looks and acts and speaks like a fire and brimstone uh, preacher, like a Wesleyan uh, preacher. Gladstone is a little Englander. He believes, and the imperialists call him a little Englander, he believes that England should be the focus of British politics. That England and the British Isles in general should be made into a better society, a more humane society, a great society by any other name. And so he does not want to get involved in foreign distractions. He is opposed to the ongoing growth of the British Empire. He is opposed to an interventionist activist foreign policy. His unwillingness, for example, to support Turkey in the 1880s ultimately brings Turkey into the orbit of Germany because under Gladstone, the British refused to help their ally and the Germans began making inroads. So whenever Gladstone is in office, the British Empire ceases in its growth. But Gladstone's great nemesis is the conservative prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli. 
By the way, you cannot find a more Jewish name than Benjamin Disraeli. He is an Anglican of Jewish ancestry who becomes leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister of Britain on several occasions. The British also, like us, aspire to a sort of grand liberal approach to ideas such as if you are English but of Jewish stock, you could still become the most powerful man in the British Empire. The most powerful person, of course, is Queen Victoria. Benjamin Disraeli deeply believes in the imperial destiny of Britain. So he is going to expand the power of the and the territory of the British Empire. In Disraeli's time, there's a question about whether Egypt will be taken. And a commander on the spot says, by Jingo, we'll take them. By Jingo. Close the, shut the fan and close the shades, please. And this uh, spawns the term jingoism to describe hyper-patriots, people who are just super, super, super mm, uh, about the power and glory of their country. Can you shut the light, right light switch off? Yes, I'm glad you agree, Alex. That's good, yes. I don't know what you were talking about. You were just emphatically saying yes, yes, yes. So let's take a look at these two men. And I'm not shutting off the camera because the camera can't see very well. And they're just images that are public domain anyway. Uh, presumably. So we'll start. with William Gladstone, spelled Gladstone, and let's get a nice big picture of him. Cool, size, loud, cool. Okay, there we go. Here's a nice photograph of him. Okay. Well, uh, actually it's possible Dickens based Scrooge to some extent. On Gladstone. So, when I say fire and brimstone preacher, I'm not just a wolf. This guy had fiery eyes when he spoke. But he looks, no, he, well, he was a religious man. He's a politician, head of the Liberal Party, Prime Minister of Britain several times during the height of imperialism, but he always opposed it. And his great uh, nemesis is... Benjamin Israeli. Grande. Now, again, not only does the man's name sound Jewish. But he stopped. They're not Chinese coolie. Don't speak like one. Rookie. A rookie Jewish. No. No. He, he does. He, he looks Jewish. He looks like a classic uh, Jewish face of that time. He's got the nose, uh, the features. He, he looks very Semitic. But again, for some reason, this man with a Jewish name and a Jewish face becomes the leader of Britain. So maybe those people who argue that white people so intolerant and so bad back in the day, ah, it's Israeli is but one example of how they can have, uh, how, they are, how our uh, European ancestors in the West were perhaps more tolerant than the radical left would like that like us to uh, believe. Okay. While we have the uh, camera up, I might as well also uh, make a technological comparison. So, let's see. You may recall, 
when we were doing the Napoleonic War. The ship of the line that Nelson commanded from, the ship of the line that he commanded from, His Majesty's ship Victory, HMS Victory. And Victory is uh, the battleship of its day. It's a ship of the line, thick, heavy wooden walls, one, two, three, four banks of cannons. Uh, ships of the line have huge numbers of cannons on their side, so while they move forward, they attack to the sides. Sail power. Beautiful sailing vessel. Still, still, still exists. That is the ultimate in pre-industrial British sea power. Now let's compare that to the flagship of the Royal Navy's Grand Fleet in World War I, HMS Iron Duke. Iron Duke is a dreadnought battleship. Oops, it gets around to doing things. Okay, tools. Okay. Model ones on the wood plank. Down, down. Do a model one. I wanted to show a diagram, darn it. Diagram. Well, there are plenty of diagrams. Fine. I'll show you the model. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there, see how blurry that is? Let's see if it really remains blurry. blurry when it gets bigger. <laughs> oh, they're just messing with me now. <laughs> they, they really are. Okay, fine. Why? And I said large. But you're assuming, of course, that Google actually has sense of the communists. And I'm not willing to concede that necessarily. Fine. Fine. Okay, so one of these, you say. I assume so. Okay, you're assuming so. Okay, well, let's, let's see. So we'll go like that. And we'll go like that. Okay. So, Sam, you're not wrong. Okay. Sam's always right. This is, except please not, this is His Majesty's <laughs> ship, Iron Duke. The Iron Duke is a dreadnought battleship. Now, dreadnought battleships became all the rage after 1906. What makes them them is their uh, mostly big gun design. These guns of the Iron Duke are 13 and a half inches. What that means is not that they're 13 and a half inches long. That's, that's obviously not the case. But they shoot a shell 13 and a half inches in diameter. Now, Dreadnought's guns of 1906, which were like eight years earlier, shot a 12-inch uh, diameter shell. The American battleships of World War II, uh, the Iowa class, for example, shoot a 16-inch shell. The Japanese battleships Yamato shoot an 18.1-inch shell. When you increase the diameter of a shell, you massively increase, increase its volume. A 13 and a half inch shell has the weight and mass of a Volkswagen. It's actually heavier than a Volkswagen. Filled with high explosives in an armor piercing shape. These can fire <clears throat> using uh, uh, spotters and uh, uh, optical uh, range finders out to the horizon which is 20 odd miles, uh, 20 to 30 miles away, and uh, it can fire accurately. Now, they tended to take uh, action at uh, 10,000, 12,000 yards, but they could fire much farther out. It's going to be a while, but I will call it. Now, the Dreadnought had armor. I believe that the Iron Duke had armor roughly equivalent to its gun diameter, so if it fired a 13 and a half inch diameter shell. The armor was probably in its heavy belt area here, 
uh, around 13 and a half inches thick of cemented Krupp's type steel. Um, it's got a secondary battery of guns and casemates. It is steam powered. It has um, steam turbines. So it's not a piston engine. It's, it's basically an early version of a jet engine in that it uses uh, spinning turbines. And it can move, I believe, at 22 to 23 knots. The Victory could move as the wind moved it, but it probably didn't move more than 10 or 12 knots. So this thing is, and Victory itself is probably about the size of this uh, superstructure to the second uh, turret here. It's much, much smaller. The difference between Iron Duke and Victory is 100 years. But the technology gap is, uh, this is worlds apart, these two. And that's just at sea. Yes? Uh, my uncle has, like, you'll walk in their house, and he just has a bunch of, like, model ships, but they're made out of, like, actual wood and stuff. Oh, cool. And, like, super fine, too, like, everything. I've never had the patience for those. Are they in bottles, or are they just, um... Uh, they're, they're, like, display. this big. Yeah. And they just, he just has them, like, all throughout Some people do that. that. Again, I don't have the patience for that kind of hobby when I paint. I'm mm -hmm. very emotional, which means <laughs> I, I'm not very disciplined. Um, okay, let's look at weapons. Because we're, we're looking at industrial age weapons. So, well, I'm going to actually bring it out here, but we'll do uh, a brown bass 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 musket. Okay. Now, let's go to all and we'll go to video. Okay. So, the brown bass is the great British musket of the Revolutionary War and the Napoleonic Wars. And you will see here how it's used. I will pause the video. No. So, that was a comparison of the technologies, get the shades please, uh, between the Napoleonic Wars and 100 years later the First World War, and the differences are industrial versus pre-industrial. So you've got HMS Victory, a wooden hulled sailing ship with smoothbore cannons out the size that can basically have an effective range of a few hundred yards, uh, versus a dreadnought battleship like the Iron Duke, which can reach out and touch someone almost 20 mile, over 20 miles away with accuracy and hit them with Volkswagen-sized shells that are high explosive and armor piercing. The Victory moves at the speed of the wind, probably 10, 12 knots. The uh, Iron Duke, which was actually slow for uh, dreadnoughts at the time, moved at 22 knots. So, uh, much, it's a quantum leap in power. Now, we took the Brown Vest Musket, which at best could get three or four shots off a minute. A good infantryman could get three or four aimed shots off a minute. And uh, compared it to this short magazine Lee, Lee Enfield rifle that the British Empire used in World War I and to an extent in World War II. And that is the comparison between a smoothbore muzzle-loading musket and a rifle with a 10-round internal magazine that is bolt action. And you could see how quickly the guy was firing. Boom, boom, I mean, just incredibly. And that was aimed fire at much greater range. Then I showed you Hiram Maxim colorized. I hate when they colorize things. Demonstrating the Maxim gun, which is the basic machine gun used in World War I by both sides. So what you've got is basically uh, something heavy enough that it requires a wheeled carriage at times. Other times it requires a multi-man crew, three or four men. And what it does is it has a belt. Uh, in, in the case of an early Maxim gun, it would have been made of canvas. And that belt has a series of bullets that have been loaded into it. You start the belt going, you, you prime it. That's what the guy was fiddling with under the gun before he started firing. You get the spring mechanism ready to go. And then with the Maxim gun, you actually hold buttons down and you're, you're, you're holding the gun like this and sweeping it back and forth. And what it does, and, and for a machine gun, that's a fairly slow rate of fire, but still, it does the job. And what you're doing is you're making an X, sort of like an infinity pattern. 
And your the machine gun is not designed to hit a single person. It's designed to cover an area denying it to the enemy. So if you're firing your machine gun properly, you're basically sweeping an area back and forth with ongoing fire. Now the magus the, the Maxim gun has a liquid liquid cooled barrel, which means there's a water tank around the barrel that you just keep pouring water into, and it'll keep the barrel firing. During battle, when you couldn't get more water, where do you think men got liquid to put into the barrel? Um, it's an entirely different type of warfare. And it's during the imperial period that the British developed this new type of industrial warfare. And the others are going to use it too. Let's look at the German Empire and the French Empire on the next page. So, the French, they don't control the area that the British do, but they do control France, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, most of West Africa, parts of Equatorial Af Africa. Uh, they control uh, Tahiti and uh, the Marquesas and uh, a lot of the area are around it in the South Sea Islands. They control the New Hebr Hebrides and New Caledonia. They control Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, which in that period is called French Indochina. Uh, they control in India, Pondicherry. Uh, so they have a few bases around India that survived. Uh, they also have some territory in China itself at Guangzhou. Um, and they control Madagascar and some of the islands in the southern Indian Ocean. Um, they also control an island off of Canada's Newfoundland. So, uh, as well as some Caribbean islands like Martinique, they control French Guiana in North Africa, Guadalupe. So the French have a much smaller empire than the British, but they still, like the British, have an empire that circles the globe for reasons that are similar. They want a variety of raw materials, and you can get that variety by going around the world. They want to have some strategic power in each area, so they do that. Now, the Germans come late to the Empire game, and Kaiser Wilhelm II, the young Kaiser with the spiky mustache, says, Germany wants a place in the sun. And let's look at what Germany is able to cobble out in the 1870s, 80s, 90s. Uh, well, they've got uh, some areas near Morocco that they try to take. They don't succeed. Uh, they take Togo land, which is near uh, Ghana today. Uh, it includes modern Togo. They have Cameroon, which is a country there. They take German Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia northwest of South Africa. They take German East Africa, which today is called Tanzania. Uh, they take a huge area of islands in the Western Pacific. The Marianas Islands, which includes Saipan. They don't take Guam because Guam is already owned by the Spanish and later by us. They take the Palau Islands, the Marshall Islands, the Caroline Islands. These are all gonna go to Japan after Germany loses World War I. There's also the Bismarck uh, Archipelago and Kaiser Wilhelm land in what is today Australia or Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Australians are going to get all of that. Uh, the Germans also control part of Samoa. America controls the other part. Now, the Germans are going to try to take over uh, the Philippines when we leave. They try to take over Samoa, and we don't let them. We take over Hawaii before the Germans can steam in. And since the United States is also very late to the game of empire, the Germans and the Americans find that we find ourselves in, in competition. But all of us, the United States, after the Spanish-American War, the Germans, the French, are emulating the British Empire. The Dutch have a pre-industrial empire that they still have a few territories from. The Portuguese still have some of their territories from the olden days. The Spaniards lose most of their territories, but they still have a few, at least until the Spanish-American War when we take them. So, empire building is the rage just at the time when Japan is learning what it is to be a modern country. 
So is it any, any surprise that the Japanese are going to become as Western as the Westerners, as aggressive as the Europeans when it comes to carving empires out of China and Korea and Taiwan and a bunch of other places? Do you know what Guam's rules are as far as mass mandate vaccine? I have no idea. Why? I, it's an American territory, uh, but the Chamorro people ru the, basically run things. Uh, they're the natives. Uh, it's an area that has a long-term Navy presence. I know that some island countries in the Pacific have tried to completely isolate. I do not believe Guam, being American territory, would be able to do that. Yeah. But I don't know. Look at the, Be welcome to look it up. So, in 1897... Queen Victoria celebrates her Diamond Jubilee, which is the 60th anniversary of her becoming queen. And the entire British Empire makes a celebration of this. There are telegraph messages from all over the world, from Quebec, from Vancouver, British Columbia, from Jamaica, from Hong Kong, from Australia and New Zealand, from uh, South Africa, uh, from... India, obviously, uh, from all over the world to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Queen Victoria being the Queen of uh, Britain and the Empress of India. And it's like the world coming together. You've got people from all over the world, black, red, white, brown, yellow. Did I leave a color out? I probably, I don't know. People of all colors come to London. Purple people. No, there's the purple people eater. That's different. Uh, listen to the song. It, it, it tells you the science. Follow the science. The idea is that the entire planet has aspects that's British. And the entire world's population in microcosm as the British Empire comes together in the celebration. Never before and never again will the British Empire ride so high. It'll get bigger. It'll get bigger before World War I and get bigger after World War I. But 1897 is before Britain begins to get outpaced by Germany. It's before a bunch of modern wars begin to drain its manpower, its vigor, its ambition. 1897 is sort of the high point of the British Empire. And it's a, a Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee is something that you should remember as that. Next time, we will look a bit at Germany's empire. We'll look at some things that lead to imperialism. And then we're going to begin a, a series of case studies on East Asia, on uh, India, on Sub-Saharan Africa. And we are going to see either in part or in toto one of the greatest movies about the age of imperialism ever made, a movie called Zulu, made in 1964, which is, well, I'll tell you when we see it. There's a reason I'm showing you the entire movie, or at least extensive ch chunks of it, because it's incredible. What? What do you want to say? Um, that... Why, why, like, why does he feel the need to prove himself? To because himself? Putin's a dictator. Look, why does a bully need to take your lunch money? Why, why, why does a bully need to, every day, go after victims? Because he can't. Putin faces in Biden a man that he deems to be weak in every way. Hitler once called Neville Chamberlain, the great British peacemaker, a worm. Also, Putin's economy is weak, it's oil-based, Price of oil has fluctuated. Putin wants to shore up his domestic power. What you do is you start a foreign war. And he thinks, perhaps rightly, that America is under such a poor leadership that he'll get away with it. And the Chinese are watching, and they're ready to go after Taiwan. And if, if, if we let them... I mean, one of the richest things I heard was yesterday or the other day, Justin Trudeau talking about liberty and fighting authoritarianism. That just to me is just, <laughs> I can't even describe it. Yes. Uh, did you hear about the F-35 that went down in the South China Sea? Yeah. Yeah. It accidentally went down. Well, no, it had an accident. Yes, it did. The question is, did we get it first or did the, did the Shai Cops? It's at the bottom of the ocean. 
Yeah, but we have ships that can do that. I was on one, the USS Grapple, about 20 years ago. Uh, we have ships, the Chicoms have ships. We also have subs. Uh, I, I believe there's a race on. I don't know if anyone's won it yet to recover that F-35. It happens. It's a dangerous job. Yeah. That's, see, that's, that's what's bad. They should have, they should have blown it. Well, it's, I'm an enemy, I won't be able to do it, but, like, circumstances, the aircraft in the water, and stuff happens, but, what angers me is that people took pictures and videos of the accident, and then not even... More than a day later, or they're on social media. Yeah, that's bad. That's a breach of security. Yeah, and whoever is on that captain, who's ever captain of the ships in the in the task force, that they, no, that's just bad. Yeah, it's a violation of OPSEC. It's the second yeah. anything like that happens on a naval ship. But in a case like this, I would rather uh, our ship's depth charge where the aircraft was, uh, rather than let Chinese communists get a hold of it. That them getting a hold of the F thirty five would be bad. Um, the F-35 is not a great fighter, but it's good at stealth. That's its thing. It's good at stealth. It's good at, it's good at electronic warfare. But in terms of speed, maneuverability, and ability to hang in a dogfight, it sucks. Excuse my French, but it really, it's bad. I, I, I do not like the F-35. It's a chronic problem where when it goes 20 degrees over angle, the tank is supposed to shake on Yeah, that's, that's not what you want in a fighter jet. Um, I'd rather be in an F-16 uh, than an F-35. It's a really good it is. Uh, but, so, yeah, they charge five people for releasing those pictures. They should. They, they should. Yeah. Just like Hillary Clinton. They <laughs> violated security codes and they should be in jail. Yeah, they charged an ensign, which I can see. He's been in the Navy for two days. But yeah. they also charged four chiefs. Well, the chiefs let it happen. Maybe they participated. No, they, they, yeah, they charged a senior chief and three chief petty officers. Which, mm. Those guys have been in the Navy for a while. They should, be they should know better. better. Uh, again, it comes from the top down. Whoever's commanding the task force and the ship captains have problems uh, that they need to fix. As to Russia and Ukraine, Putin seems to be trying to nip it off bit by bit. Uh, and Biden, as I understand it, is, is, is fighting it with sanctions. But he isn't, he isn't using America's way to close the, or stop the Russian pipeline to Europe. He's not using all the tools. Uh, I I have concerns. I don't want to go too much into them here because I, I, I'm not trying to stoke war fever. I think it's bad. I think that allowing Russia to take Ukraine or even significant chunks of it would be bad for the peace of the world. And my real concern really isn't Ukraine as much as it is Taiwan. Uh, and it's not just a sentimentality about having free Chinese under communist boots. It's also that the world's semiconductor industry is centered on Taiwan. And if the Chai Coms get it, they get the semiconductor industry of the world, which is kind of important in the computer age. Just a little. Uh, anyway, you have any other questions, comments, thoughts about current events? Okay. We did that right. We did it at the end when I was done. So, well done. Thank you, and uh, we will continue tomorrow.